wonderful to see so many people here and I think it's a testament to um, Audrey and Anthony, uh, the popularity, uh, and I think we'll keep growing with the publication of, of this wonderful new collection. Um, I'd like to congratulate Pitt Street Poets, John and Lindsay Knight, for bringing out this extraordinary volume and also for continuing to support Australian poetry and uh, producing such really beautiful and elegant books. So thank you very much to the both of you. Um, and of course to congratulate Audrey and Anthony on really a, an absolutely amazing book. I mean, I'm just completely floored by it. And to see collaboration, you know, working so beautifully is just a complete joy. So congratulations. I Thanks, mean, it's just a, it's, so a, it's a wonderful achievement and I'm so thrilled to be here launching the book. Yeah, thank you. you. Thank you so much for asking me. Um, a collaboration is not all that common in Australian poetry. I can think of um, Peter Boyle, and Peter's here tonight, uh, and Margie Cronin have done work together. I think John Jenkins and Ken Bolton have done some things. And of course there was uh, James McCauley and um, Harold Stewart, although that was much more cynical kind of exercise. But collaboration is not all that common uh, in Australian poetry, but um, I'm so glad that Anthony and Audrey got together on this one and produced this absolutely remarkable work. So I'm going to ask Anthony and Audrey questions. Some of them will be directed at both of them and some will be directed at them individually. But um, uh, this is a question to both of you. Um, can you just tell us how this work started? Over to you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Judith. Um, we, well, it was a very strange story. I think um, early 2019, Anthony contacted me on Facebook saying he really admired some of my recent poems. And I immediately thought it was a stitch up. I thought, um, this is some sort of, you know, someone just having me on. So um, we sort of had a few messages back and forth. I sent him a few poems I'd written about my mother. He gave me some really terrific feedback, so I kind of realized it was actually the real Anthony Lawrence. Um, and then we, you know, we conversed a little over Facebook and Messenger for a few months. Yeah. Um, and then it wasn't until several months later, um, we, I, I was at Mass with my son for his, one of his sacraments at school. And on the missalette was something about the 20th Sunday of Ordinary mm, Time. Mm. And I, I typed it into notes in my phone thinking, that's so interesting, I'll, I'll put it on a title for a poem when I go home. And about a few days or maybe a week later, Anthony sent me a message about Leonard Cohen, both really big fans of Leonard Cohen, and said, um, oh, did you know that when he was in Hydra, he, he, he was interviewed and he said, we didn't know it was the 60s then, we just thought it was ordinary time. Would, wouldn't, that, wouldn't ordinary time be a great title for, for a poem or a book? And I said, oh, well, that's funny that you should say that. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, it's been like that the whole time, really. Yeah, lots of spooky coincidences, which I Amazing. think happens when you collaborate. You sort of get into a, yeah. a common mindset and those things happen. I think that happens when things are meant to be, too. You know, you get these mm. synchronicities that, you know, play out, and I think that's uh, a good indication that this was meant to happen. Yeah. Um, Anthony, do you want to add anything? Or? Only that um, uh, I was really... I mean, Audrey's work stood out for me immediately, and... Uh, and I, and I sensed, um, it's often said that what we value and like in other people's poetry reflects on things that we would like for our own work. Um, and, I, and I sensed a, um, a, real, a real dynamic and a, and a magical syntax in the work that I aspire to. And that, that really set things going for me. And, uh, and, I, and I thought, uh, over, over a short exchange, I thought, there's something... Um, amazing about this and I I was really hoping that the magic spell would continue and it did so uh, some things you can't force some things organically fall into place and this certainly did so um, and it just continued on from that from that that short burst of energy which became sustained and and sustaining and uh, uh, and an amazing exchange of minds and Marriage of Souls was just a, a, a real treat in all respects. Yeah. Thank you. 
That's that's lovely. Um, and I think you know we as readers are, are, are going to be the recipients of this wonderful exchange. So thank you, thank you for getting together like that. It's it's been wonderful. Um, uh, the the book um, mentions a number of poets. So I wonder if you could say something about um, the kind of literary works with which you are having a conversation in ordinary time. Well. We're both voracious readers of poetry, as you are, and so um, whatever comes across our radar, if it lights up our inner attention, then it gets used. And um, uh, whatever I was reading at the time, I, I th in fact, I, I, I know that I was reading uh, some very early Mary Oliver for my students. I teach creative writing at Griffith University. And, um, and so I was, was really in the heartland of that celebration of the natural world and uh, that fed directly into the early poems. Uh, <clears throat> it, it, when it started to, when, I, when we talked about a time machine, that's when things got really exciting for me because we could go anywhere and visit poets that we've loved uh, and that's what happened. We just jumped into this old contraption and off we went. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it didn't, we didn't start off with the time machine because we didn't plan the collaboration. So the first poem was a, you know, a why are we here, or where do we go when we die kind of poem. And then um, Anthony's response was a time machine. And then, you know, you sort of go, oh, we have a time machine. We can do all these things. So it's quite exciting, and well, then you run with it. The time machine, I'm, I'm pretty sure it came from the memory of my, my maternal grandfather's shed in the backyard in Tamworth because he had this old sulky in the rafters with its decaying leather straps and its, its swallow's nests in the seating and the batting in them. And I always, as a child, imagined jumping into this thing and flying away. And I, I think that's what I modelled modeled it on because we actually built it in a shed, didn't we? In the yeah, poems, yeah. In the barn, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, the time machine is wonderful in the book because, as you were saying, it just allows you to travel back and forth in time, place, and it's just a wonderful imaginative construct of, yeah. of what you do in the book. Um, um, so um, perhaps at this stage I could ask you to read from the opening sequence. I'll just say before I start this that um, talking about the influences and in poems that it's in conversation with, um, Muriel Rukeyser's poem from the 1960s, American feminist poet, um, one of her poems has a really arresting line uh, uh, where she says, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. And I had that line in my, in my mind for some time before this poem was written. I don't know if I can tell you the truth. What if truth were prismatic, everyone looking through fruit-colored panes? If I said they've tracked down a Goldilocks planet, neither too hot nor cold, equipped for life and only 110 light years from here, how long would it take my thoughts to arrive? Would thinking be instant, or is there a hole of mirrors it must traverse? If I wrote to say researchers have claimed the soul doesn't die, but resides in the microtubules of brain cells after we pass and pass on, and the quantum information that is consciousness continues even outside the body in the cosmos, what would you say? <laughs> One day, the 20th Sunday in ordinary time, on a life-supporting planet, a woman in a Mary Quant dress will cross the road, unaware she carries the tiny germ of me. Your mind is a meadow of swaying grass, mine a cliff face for wild strawberries grow. When I unpacked the time machine from its iron bark sarcophagus, the one my maternal grandfather had cut, planed and sanded to a shell, intended for his own shape. The parts were wrapped in oilcloth, redolent of mud and straw. I was in a panel of, min of winter sun, the barn like a hangar, where the field is a runway, 
the windsock, a corella rising and falling on a branch. The first images of the Goldilocks planet had appeared on the news like a mirror ball dusted with ocean light. Sky the colour of helical arteries in the umbilicus. The machine gleamed as it came together. I leaned over my work, dispersing small metallic sounds, considering your theories on the spirit as wildflowers pressed into service. Electrons and protons in our personal versions of the Hadron Collider. As I tightened the last bolt, I surrendered to the image of mothers, one in a Mary Quant dress and one in tennis whites, airline hostesses off duty, crossing roads as we ebb and flow in respective bathospheres. Who knows where the time goes drifted through the retaining walls of both worms. When the last lines of light withdrew from the barn, I stood back and studied the machine. A night bird clocked on as I polished a dial with my sleeve. Where would you go first, my friend, when the apparatus glows with banks of tiny lights and hums like the aurora? Back in time or forward, novel world or old, there's some allure about a frontier, but backstory is backbone. Even here, 20 years beside a harbor moored with maxi yachts, I am jellyfish afloat. Trees so different, figs, their roots like desert city walls. How finely calibrated is this thing? And did they ever solve the paradox of meeting with your younger self? Some say each atom in our bodies is replaced in seven years, and so the risk is low. Lower still, to meet each other retrospectively. To see the handsome shells our hermit selves inhabit for a while. Where do those shells retire? Are they the ones discovered on the shore, scooped from strands of rack before we pocket them and forget? Somewhere a cow stands in the shade of a flowering horse chestnut, each filigree candlestick blessing her like a thurible at benediction. She is the last of her kind. I'd return to where you were the day I passed, disguised as egret, loon or puffin, with the roofing nails of sand eels looping from my beak. You looked up, pressed the blade of your hand above your eyes for shade, and waved once, your recognition reserved for flight. And so I called and came around, skywriting my name into the overcast until you said a windy thing, and I went off to understand it. Now the time machine has been assembled and prepared, I have set the date for 20 years before you came to weather, trees and water, even Dylan Thomas would find difficult to curse with praise. I know these beaches, gone to Sharps deposit boxes where men with metal detectors mine the sand for rings and watches. I lost my father's wedding band night fishing in the surf. We summon the spectres of recovery and loss, we return to what we love. Tonight, I am setting out for where you were, signal station, beacon, satellite gleam. Watch for me through the storm windows of your coupled hands. Thank you, that's beautiful, beautiful, thank you. I think the audience can um, hear what a, a wonderful dialogue has started to open up and it just continues uh, through the rest of the book. And, and so perhaps I can ask you both, um, so you were exchanging sort of individual poems. Uh, what was it about a particular poem that then sparked off your, your, your subsequent poem? Was it something small? Could it just have been something like okay. a word or an image? Or how did that eventually? Yeah, it was a very interesting process. I'm not sure at what level it happens, but it sort of reminded me of things that happen in music, in like Baroque music, like fugues, you know, where you have counterpoint. So you have a line in one poem, and then you have a, an echo of that sort of line or idea in another poem. That happens all through the book, sometimes 
quite far apart, but ideas or words or images will recur. Um, and the first part, the first whole section was written in about 10 days, yeah. um, was very intense. So the ideas were flying, um, we were sort of sparking off each other. There was smoke coming out of my <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, obviously, you can't sustain that and also keep your job and feed your children. So it did sort of settle down after that. But um, yeah, the, the the energy and the sort of um, synchronicity at the beginning was something that I hadn't really encountered. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Judith, we've we've talked in the past um, quite extensively about the poetic impulse, and I think this is one of the uh, finest examples of um, of how I recognise. How, how I respond to the written word um, and to music and so in this case Audrey's lines that it comes upon me in a way that I am totally unprepared for so um, a line or, or a draft of a poem will arrive uh, as a message or an, or, or an email and as soon as I enter into the fabric of that thinking and dreaming I'm off I was just I didn't know what I was going to be writing because I never do when I start a poem. I don't like to know about subject matter so much um, because poems tend to write themselves a lot and this is certainly the case with this book. Uh, it was a, a, I mean it really is a form of pure magic uh, and, uh, and very difficult or useless to question it um, and, and it doesn't last for a long time. So um, it was a great gift, really. Mm. Thank you. Um, so the book's in five sections. Um, I just wondered if, is that the order in which you uh, wrote the poems? Um, pretty much, yeah. We, we they got shuffled around a bit. There was a little bit of shuffling and um, sometimes Anthony would send four poems through. So there'd be a little bit of, just slow down so I can write some poems. <laughs> So there was a little bit of shoehorning and things in some sections after with that initial section. Um, we sort of hovered around the four sections for some time yeah. before we wrote that last section. Um, and we weren't sure whether our ca characters, um, our protagonists would actually meet in time space or not. Mm -hmm. And so that was something, that was the last part that we wrote. Yeah. I, th I think that's terrific because I think the reader wonders as they're reading through the volume, oh, do, do they meet? There's, there's a sense of them meeting across time and space all, all the time, yeah. but, but there is an, an apprehension, isn't there, that, that, that you think, is there going to be a meeting somewhere in the world? And, and how will they get there? Yeah. yeah. I think that's right. I think that's, that's just a lovely aspect mm. of the mm. book. It yeah. really it holds it together in a way, you know, for the, for the reader to keep pursuing the, the narrative of, mm. of this dialogue. Um, um, So, so you wrote in a way with, with no forward plans. Um, this book in a way was just an organic process of your individual imaginations and poetic processes. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Um, and, and perhaps that's why it's so successful that if you had planned it, um, you know, it would have lost something. It would have, it would have you know, just not had that, that magic that you, you mentioned, Anthony. Um, did, did you have any idea, um, I mean, it seems to me that you could almost just keep going forever <laughs> with this uh, volume because it's just, uh, it's so rich. Um, so when it came to an end, um, how did you feel? It, it didn't end suddenly, did it? Um, well, I think when we got to a certain stage with the poems, we we sort of, you know, then we organised them into the shape of the book, um, you know, it, you know. The real writing began as they and, and the line, the line breaks, all that sort of editing, which is another stage, uh, more, it's harder work, but it's um, just as important. Mm. Um, and so that stage took a while as well. So that was quite a meticulous stage of adding the, it, the line mm, breaks. And it was that. meticulous and there were line edits, but, but we also did a marvellous uh, structural um, and um, um, really putting a lot of emotional pressure on images that weren't quite working until we both, you know, they cracked under that kind of intensity, that kind of focus. 
Yeah. Um, that was amazing, that process, because that's where we really started to shape the book. <clears throat> and we retained ownership of our own poems all the way through. So if each of us wrote one poem, mm. you know, there's no joint poem in there. There's no co-writing. The, no. Yeah, so there might be uh, an edit that one, one of us would suggest to the other, but they was up to them whether they weren't going to take it or not. Yeah. Another thing that's remarkable about the book is that all the poems are in the same form. And it's a lovely form. It's kind of sine wave. Yeah, sine wave. Yeah. A kind of tidal flow. The lines, you know, come in and out. Um, and both Audrey's and Anthony's poems all follow the same form. Um, can you say anything about how that particular form was chosen? Well, that was Anthony's choice. I uh, was very keen on that form and for all the poems to look the same and uh, create a seamless flow through the book and not have them look like they were from two separate authors. Um, and not have titles, so that was very much uh, coming from Anthony. But it's um, it it tends to allow the eye to to really flow down the page, and um, it wasn't so much a novelty at all. Really, it was it just seemed the right shape, and Audrey was happy with that idea, and we stuck with it. I think it, it was a really fantastic decision to do that because it gives. It gives a unity to the book. I mean, um, another thing that's interesting about the poems is that neither Anthony's name or Audrey's name are attributed to any of the poems. Um, I could tell because I know Anthony's work extremely well and I know Audrey's work really well, so I kind of guessed whose, whose poems they were. But can you say something about the, um, the reason why you didn't uh, attribute your names to any of the poems? Uh, just to not put up road markers and milestones and identifying markers because we felt that uh, by doing that there'd be a far more um, um, a, a sense of um, negating reader prediction it would be the main thing but also uh, just a, a wonderful seamless way to read a book without titles, without names because not just one poem flows into each other, but each idea flowed into the next, and so there were no nothing to sort of stop you and halt the reading. It was just a on you go, and that's the way we wanted it. Yeah, and I think again that was a terrific decision because um, it does have that seamless flow to it. And I think if you put your names to the poems, it would have it would have just damaged. It would have that. seemed odd. Yeah, yeah. Seemed considering odd. how we wrote the book. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Because the, the books are kind of, it's a, it's a unity, really. It is, yeah. And I think to have split it up into the individual mm. parts, you know, would just not be, yeah. uh, not serve the book at all. Um, there, there are a couple of wonderful poems in, in the second section of the book in which you both describe how you came to both poetry. Uh, Audrey, you say, a ten-year-old girl wanders with a cock's pippin in her hand. It's my epiphany that poetry should shift and occupy the ones it chooses, as if we decide. Anthony, you say, I was nine when poetry slipped chicken wire over my face, turned me around fast until the sky was leaking light, then set me free to put fire to what's in hiding and gather in what dark darkens the blood. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit, bit about how you, you both came to poetry. Over to you. Um, well, I mean, I guess these poems are a little autobiographical, as there are many autobiographical threads through the book, even though it's fiction. Um, I was, uh, I wrote poems as a child. I had a little diary um, with my childish poems in them. And I was really interested in poetry, but I was also really interested in physics, mm. um, the physics of light. And um, I in Ireland in the 80s and 90s you had to do something that you'd get a job from so physics won out over the poetry and um, yeah I, I, I think my, my poem will probably tell the rest of the story but um, I, I don't know about you what about you? Uh, I, my, grandma, my grandmother my mum's mother had a lot to do with this because uh, my dad was quite ill when I was growing up and um uh, uh, I was sent off to Tamworth to spend time with my grandparents and, um, and my grandmother used to read to me each night from what I found out was a book called Come Hither, which is a, 
a large anthology of capital R romantic poetry, where I first heard uh, Alfred Noyes' The Highwayman. And so um, iambic pentameter got in my head and stayed there. And, um, and the image of, um, you know, the, 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 the moor was a, the, the purple moor, you know. And, um, the moon is a lofting I know, that's right. And the, 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 the road is a purple ribbon. Beautiful, isn't it? And the, the, the ghostly galleons tossed upon cloudy seas. So that all, that all stayed with me. And, and I think I started writing poetry at, at about eight, seven or eight, I think. Mm. Um, would you like to read um, those little bits of uh, poems that um, talk about how you came to poetry? I mean, page 32. Uh, 32, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> I was nine when poetry slipped chicken wire over my face. That's because I, I used to go out to this choco vine in my grandmother's and grandfather's backyard and pressed my face into the chicken wire and that kind of, the memory stayed with me. Chicken wire over my face turned me around fast until the sky was leaking light, then set me free to put fire to what's in hiding and gather in what darkens the blood. As a stand of trees in a fairy tale or a prose poem's boxed in sleight of hand, when I looked again, <laughs> Poetry was already on the roof of the house, leaning on a red ceramic finial, staring down at me. It had a shape, but not one you could name. Poetry was of itself in air and wind, form and style. I'd received the baton, a nerve ending made from the hair of a thylacine. While a young man experiments with rhyme and notions of poetry a hemisphere away, in a buckram-bound diary, the colour of tobacco, an eight-year-old writes a poem for each letter of the alphabet, starting with A for autumn or Auden, her neat quatrains interspersed with floral motifs rendered in gouache. She veers off course seduced by the glitter of glass discs and tubes, and doesn't write a line for 30 years. And when the words return, it's as though they had been written all along and siloed in her mind. That was how poetry returned in search of me, not as winter or the river of a Chilean poet, but as the spring of deep feeling, a summer swallow in the minaret of the Hearts Cathedral. <laughs> Thank you, that's lovely. Um, you, you mentioned Leonard Cohen just uh, a little while ago. Uh, do you share any other poetic influences? Yeah. Lots, lots of Irish poets. Yeah. Um, um, I think we share lots of, yeah, lots of them, like from the poets of the imagination, like Emily Dickinson and Wallace Stevens, uh, lots of the Irish lyric poets, and also the lyrics of songs is something that we share as well. Dylan Thomas. Yeah, and also um, Ada Lamont and all the, the Ada Lamont um, Natalie Diaz correspondence was certainly an inspiration for this correspondence. Yeah. So yeah, I think we share quite a few, but we don't agree on lots of poems. So sometimes I'll send Anthony a poem and go, "That's rubbish." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I still have an issue with Sharon Alder's line breaks. <laughs> she needs to sort that out. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with? Her? In many ways, um, this book is an intense and hallucinatory journey. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a search for self, a search for home, a search for poetry. Um, and you both draw on nature to tell each other quite um, you know, surrealistic stories, which is a, a wonderful feature of the book. Um, Audrey, your voice feels quite restless, um, as if it hasn't yet found its true home in terms of, say, a sense of place, um, other than perhaps in poetry, of course. Um, Anthony, your voice seems perhaps more settled in the transformations that nature and poetry can bring, yet there's also grief and longing. Yeah. Uh, would you agree with this assessment? Oh, I totally. I, I, I certainly I would. I'm not sure about how, how you see that. 
Yeah, I think that's really well observed. Um, I, I've, I'm bearing in mind that this was written three years ago now. Amazing. Almost to the day. Um, the, I, I have struggled with developing and finding a sense of place as an emigrant to Australia and have, um, and have written quite a lot about it recently and sort of come to the conclusion that it's, it's easier for me to develop a sense of place with around water than around the land. Mm -hmm. Maybe just the transformative fluid nature of water is more fitting with the immigrant experience um, compared to the fixed land. But you loved land. water as a child in Wexford too, didn't oh, you? Oh yeah, I've always grown up near the sea and mm. spent time in the sea. So that's always mm. been, I think it's very common for poets to have a very close uh, affinity with the sea. Seems to be, yeah. Yeah, I, think so. I, I love those uh, poems set in the sea. I think, I think that's mm. probably my favorite section of the whole book. Could you read a little bit from, from that section? Yeah, sure. One, just one thing about um, the natural world and its influence. I've always um, been, uh, I really like to write about uh, uh, the natural world before, uh, during and after human interaction or, in, or intervention and what happens. What happens when you just walk into a field and there's a tree filled with corellas? What, what does that mean and how does it affect everything? So that's that's often on my mind. Do I start with this one? Yeah. yeah. Narwhal. Just saying the word is enough to test the low registers of my voice as though I had uttered confluence, fluted, tied. Captive narwhals are entries in a leather-bound compendium of death by intervention. Say endangerment. Then hold your breath to hear Scrimshaw die out in a total absence of light, three to five thousand feet below the ice. The salt water stung as it entered the navy blue moth of my lungs, a dark pool where remembrance ceases to be visual, becomes sound, Beyond the white noise of peristalsis lies the heartbeat of the world, some call mother. Having tired of air and sky, I have returned by choice in late summer, slipping from the limpid blistered pier, being water, like Bruce Lee, <laughs> taking on the shape of curiosity, the space between bivalves or the fractalized polyps of corals being the sea. Lovely, thank you. Um, and I'll just ask a couple more questions before I open up to the, the audience there. But um, I think what's um, remarkable about both of your poetry is, is the way that you imaginatively push through your material. Um, you're both expansive poets. Um, in other words, you always take that step further to give your poetry that sort of extra layer of emotion and transformation. Um, it's also a layering of tones, I think, that's so interesting. You can, you know, move through seriousness, humour, wonder, self-reflection, and be mused observation all in the one poem. Can you say anything about this? Um, for me, it was uh, just running on my nerve and intuition and feeding directly off Audrey's wonderful syntax. So when you have, when you are working with someone whose vision um, is closely aligned to your own in, in this book, and the images startle you out of complacency, uh, things things open up um, to to a sense of wonder and and definitely humour, because some of the things still crack me up when I read them. <laughs> Um, you know, flying in that bloody contraption, um, but really, it was all it was all about it was all about the collaboration. That's what that's what the magic was. It was don't know if I could, if that can ever happen again in my writing life, but it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so, so were there any particular challenges with the collaboration? I mean, co collaboration. I would think. I mean, personally, I can't imagine. Collaborating with anyone, but, um, but it, um, it obviously just you know just produce magic from from both of them. So, but were there you know sort of sticking points or or 
challenges that uh, came along the way? Yeah, I, I, naturally there, there were. I mean, we the writing itself was relatively straightforward. We sort of just went with it. I'm not normally a go with it kind of person, as you know, Judith, from my planning. I'm a very, you know, nothing un, unprepared sort of person, and, and Nancy's not like that at all. But we just went with the writing. But the the decisions around, um, you know, some of the decisions around the structure and the all of that sort of thing. You have to, in a collaboration, one person or both people have to be willing to um, accept the other person's idea and be very open to it. So you can't be too rigid. I think that's a given. And um, mostly that worked really well. I yeah. Think. I think it was an issue. Long conversations while driving. Remember driving uh, one day a week, I drive from <laughs> Brisbane down to the Gold Coast to give a, a lecture and a tutorial. Um, and, uh, and it's a two hour drive. And often I remember that drive was taken up with with um, with discussing uh, problems, problem solving, yeah. uh, shuffling of lines, um, yeah. But it was great fun, and and really, the, it was sort of a, a the, there wasn't much uh, uh, unease at all about it, was there? I mean, there were a couple of times where we disagreed with each other, but mostly it was amazing. Yeah, I think um, I think with a collaboration, as you mentioned earlier, Anthony, you have a window with it, and you sort of go enter a, a common plane that's, that you don't normally, uh, you know, exist on, and you're sharing something, so you're quite vulnerable. You're quite open to another person, a person that you haven't met, um, and who you don't really know in real life, but you know them very well through their work. But it, it is a vulnerable place to be, and you're very exposed. So I think there has to be a lot of trust there, yeah. and how it has to be a lot of respect there, and so otherwise. It could really, you know, fall down. Yeah. Um, so that's a challenge, and I think it's a challenge. Um, uh, you know, no, I think I think that it comes with its challenges, but we found that the the work was was worth it. Was worth overcoming them. It was. Thank you very much. Uh, we're just about running out of time, I think, Denza. Uh, one more question. Um, this question has nothing to do with the book whatsoever, but I just thought I'd throw this in. Um, just because it, uh, it requires a very imaginative answer. So Audrey, I'd like to ask you, um, what instruments are needed to create the sound of moonlight falling across the ocean? <laughs> wow. Um, well, I, I think, um, well, there are existing instruments, like a glockenspiel or a beautiful instrument we heard at a reading last night, which was called a a hand pan, rasp vast or something. It was beautiful kettlebell. Um, but I, I think I'd like to make my own instrument. So I, I, um, I think I'd make it from some tiny demitasse teaspoons and a shattered mirror and the mallet bone from the inner ear of a whale. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, that would be absolutely beautiful to hear. Um, Anthony, oh. what kind of meal can you cook in the eye of a hurricane? Wow. Okay. Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is a is a is a is a quote from uh, Kurt Wallinger from World Party, where he says, um, uh, "You're a hurricane, and I'm a roofing tile." Um, but 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 I do have a, I do have an answer for that, and I'd like to read a very short poem by Ada Lamon from this magnificent book, um, The Hurting Kind, that I picked up from Glee Books today. Because if, if I could eat a poem, it would be this. And to the fox comes with its streak of red flashing across the lawn, squirrel bound and bouncing almost as if it were effortless to hunt, food being an afterthought or just a little boring. He doesn't say a word, just uses those four black feet to silently go about his work, which doesn't seem like work at all, but play. Fox lives on the edges, pieces together a living out of leftovers and lazy rodents, too slow for the telephone pole. He takes only what he needs and lives a life that some might call small, has a few friends, 
likes the grass when it's soft and green, never cares how long you watch, never cares what you need when you're watching, never cares what you do once he's gone. Okay, um, well, look, thank you both so much for um, this conversation. Um, it's just been a great pleasure for me and hearing you read. Thanks, Jim. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book. It's been great. Um, but I would like to just ask the audience if they would like to ask Anthony and Audrey anything at all. Of these sort of occasions where I hear people talk about their poetry. And I always sit and think, oh my goodness me, that was such an amazing experience. But I think, in a way, you're really at the mercy of the reader in a sense that punctuation would never be more important than what it is in poetry, the pacing and everything else. So I suppose the question is, that, is it something, it's like the reverse of somebody who's controlling something. You have to actually allow people to actually read into it. At the same time, no one's going to read it like you have today, I would imagine. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, it, I do. We were talking about this last night, actually, and talking about re uh, you mm. know po poetry that's read is so yeah. different to poetry on the page. You know how long the poem is and where the line breaks are. You don't get any words wrong. So reading it to an audience through a mic um, is fraught. Um, and often you hear a poem read and go, wow, I, I read that before, but I, I never got that out of it. I, I think, is that what you're sort of referring to? That you, yeah, and, and you, might, you might read a poem yeah. a few times, but then you hear the person, especially the person who wrote it, read the poem. You get so much more of the emotion. Yeah, yeah that's right. And that's what I've heard, and honestly, I'm, it's like a Vindictin chocolate. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if people at the back heard that, but... Um, she, she just said that it's been like being dipped in chocolate, so <laughs> I think that, that's wonderful. What, what, just, one, just to add to that, one of the things that I love about reading poetry is that, as um, Emily Dickinson said, you know, poets and readers are the friends of the soul and the, sh and the bookshelf, but when I read a poem by John Keats, the guy might be dead a long time, but there's a sense of immediacy that you know this was written by an amazing living person and it's still there. And so time really, I mean, it's the same with Shakespeare, it's the same with, you know, King David, whatever, but you can read poetry and just know that um, that exchange, that fresh exchange will never fade away. It's amazing. Any other questions? Um, when you're doing the to and fro in your collaboration, uh, were either of you uh, at any time ever concerned that the other might dominate the other by either the force of their poetry or the force of their reply? I'll just repeat that. So, um, uh, the gentleman's asking whether either of you ever felt kind of the possibility that one might dominate the other in the, in, during the collaboration. Great question, Michael. Mm, yeah. I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> um, I think, um, I think. Well, certainly from my perspective, I really just try to bring my A game. I, I, you know, these amazing poems would come through in what seemed an impossibly short amount of time, and um, I just really tried to hit back my best shots. So I think um, it was very inspiring, and um, to to try and step up and, and respond to my best ability, yeah. um, rather than feeling in any way that it was dominant, it was inspiring. That was the effect on me, there, anyway. There was, no, there was no sense of competitiveness at all. It was just sometimes it worked, sometimes it worked really well, other times it took a lot of uh, finessing, but mostly it was just when we were on, we were on, and that was, and that, that was all, that, all that really went on for me for quite some time. I was just devoted to this. Yes, Oh, great question, Peter. Yeah. Oh, I'll just repeat that. Uh, mm. um, did you feel that um, this process took your poetry somewhere new that you might not have, I guess, gotten to otherwise? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. And what was that newness? And what was that newness? Mm. I think um, stepping away from 
reality was a, a big thing that happened to, to me anyway. Uh, I remember sending a message one day to Anthony saying, um, wow, you met Anna at Mahalava. Like, how old were you then? Mm. And he said, um, we have a time machine, silly. <laughs> so, what can you be thinking? <laughs> so just realizing you could just make it all up was really like a revelation for me. So I think it was very freeing. And that was a big thing that I took away from the collaboration. You know, having breakfast with Ezra Pound, I mean, how good take, doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. <laughs> It's a great question, yes, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wondered about gender. Obviously, you're a man and a woman. And I wondered if the collaboration was like a romance or like a love affair. And I just, I just wondered about, well, and just the notion of that you're a woman, Audrey, and you're a man. I just wondered how that worked and the dynamic. Uh, I, I was just asking about the dynamic between, you know, or you being a woman, Anthony, a man, how, how did that sort of play out uh, during the collaboration? Well, it just, it, 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 it enabled us to invent amazing people and to, to, to layer the lives of these people we'd invented with, with elements of autobiography, with elements of, um, of, of magic realism, uh, elements of, of really a deep attention to poetics, uh, so um, th there was that that um, black and white, left and right, up and down, sideways, going on all the time. But, but it was a wonderful thing, and, and, and you're very aware of it. You can't not be. But um, just to add to that, Anna, I think that um, it's a it's a great question, and it's something that has come up. Um, I think obviously, you know, it doesn't have to be a man and a woman. It could be any chemistry, but there's certainly a chemistry evident in the writing that you know we've we've leveraged off that to create the story and to create the narrative yeah. um, and we've drawn on our own um, individual uh, experience of love and limerence and loss and uh, yeah. heartbreak to write those stories and write those poems so that the connections uh, between the people in the book are very strong um, and I think yeah I think it's probably easier to do that um, if you're you know if, if, I guess if there's potential in a real life, there's a chemistry that can then feed into the poetry. So, yeah, yeah I, think, I think it's a, a really good question. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Look, we'll probably um, wind it up there, I think. But um, thank you very much to the audience for the great questions. And, but of course, thank you so much to Audrey and Anthony. It's just been fantastic. And, um, uh, look, you're just you're falling in love with this book, absolutely. So um, I'd like to thank you both very much. I'd like to thank you, Judy. Yeah, thank thanks, you so thanks, much. Judith. It's been such an honour to have you launch the book. I'd also like to thank Anthony for being my co-author throughout this. And it's great to meet you. <laughs> we just met about an hour ago. Um, also, like to thank the publisher, Lindsay and John, for being so supportive and bringing yeah. their dream Another to reality. Another beautiful book. Thank you. Um, and Dan at Roaring Stories, and all of you guys for making the effort to show up tonight and be such a wonderful audience. Yeah, so thanks really very much, it. everyone. Thank yeah. you.